Well, should we start, Hector? You can start. Uh, I'll let you know once uh, we get a new member uh, joining us, uh, but you cannot take any action at this okay. point. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of COBRO. Um, uh, thank you for taking the time to join the meeting today. Uh, hopefully at some point we'll be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting, but uh, uh, Meanwhile, we'll continue as we have been for the last several years. Uh, please note that simultaneous interpretation is available. And I would like to ask our interpreter to briefly explain how the feature works and to provide the information in the chat if possible. Good afternoon, my name is Nancy Hand and Vinka Valdivia and I will be the interpreters for this afternoon's meeting. I will give Zoom instructions in Spanish followed by English. Buenas tardes, yo soy Nancy Hand y junto con Vinka Valdivia seremos las intérpretes para la reunión del día de hoy. Voy a dar las instrucciones para usar la interpretación por Zoom en español y después en inglés. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación que aparece como un globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en un celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos o tres puntos, luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. To use the Zoom interpretation feature, please scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, which looks like a globe, and select either English or Spanish. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone or tablet or other device, press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Thank you. Okay. Um... Thanks very much. Uh, uh, before continuing, uh, Hector, do we have a quorum yet or not? Yes, you have quorum already. Okay, good. Uh, well, first, uh, I, I would like to review the process and guidelines for conducting the meeting virtually on Zoom. For COBRO members, please note you are not automatically muted by the meeting organizer, so you will need to mute yourself and unmute yourself. In addition, when you would like to speak, please turn on your camera or raise your hand by opening your uh, participants panel on the Zoom toolbar and clicking raise hand at the bottom. Once uh, the staff sees you, uh, you will be recognized at that time. For members of the public who would like to speak on an item, uh, please use the raise hand icon in the Zoom toolbar. When you're called on, you will be unmuted by Sandag staff. If you're calling in by phone, you may need to enter star six to unmute yourself. After your comments, you will be muted by Sandag staff. If you're calling into the meeting today, please press star nine on your phone if you'd like to comment on an item. All comments, whether emailed or live, will be made part of today's record. Uh, are there any comments about this process? Any questions? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, good. Well, uh, today, as you know, is election day in uh, California. And uh, as politicians used to say, vote early and often. Uh, and yesterday was, or Sunday was election day in six Mexican states. So the political process continues to uh, be very active as we are navigating out of the pandemic, but still in a virtual mode for many things. At any rate, it's good to see you all virtually. Uh, and um, we hope to continue our work of COBRO. Uh, Let's move on to the agenda. The first item uh, is uh, that for public comments and communications and member comments. Uh, uh, do we have any, um, any yes. comments at this point? Yes, Mr. Sherman, you have one member from the public, Catherine Rose. Okay. Just allow to talk. Please go ahead. Uh, wonderful. 
Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes. I'm a civil engineer here in San Diego. My comments, um, I gave my comments before for John Kelly of the U US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Sandag staff. And then this is also directed for our Mexican, um, our neighbors from Mexico. At the April 8th, 2022 Sandag Tour State Route 11 and Otay Mesa East Port of Entry, Sandag CEO stated there was a new state and federal alternative project delivery method and joint venture agreement created between Sandag Caltrans and state and federal agency border patrol in mexico to finance and build the otay mesa east port of entry project the alternative project delivery method was allowed by new state law and street and highway code section 31460 through 82 the otay mesa east toll facility act not sure but i believe the general service administration or other federal departments are usually the planners and builders of these types of federal port of entry projects not sandag staff so this is what I am recommending. I'm recommending that the EPA, Sandag, Mexico, and the International um, International Boundary and Water Commission look into creating a similar new federal alternative project delivery method like Otay Mesa East for the raw sewage border pollution issue um, with Mexico along the Tijuana River. Everybody's aim, um, blaming the EPA for not moving fast enough to stop the ongoing pollution and I'm not sure how many hundreds of million dollars are available that were awarded to the APA for border infrastructure. A new law and agreement with EPA Mexico with Sandag's border committee in charge with EPA oversight and collaboration could speed up construction and a new alternative project delivery method would allow for local control by having the EPA allow Sandag's border committee to take over development of EPA funded border infrastructure cleanup projects in order to cut through bureaucracy and move projects toward completion with known timelines again with oversight by the <sighs> EPA. Imperial Beach Mayor Serge Dedina was positive by the idea to give work for program management and construction to Sandag staff um, to Sandag um, staff control if possible. And so, you know, my questions, is, I'm not sure what the EPA thinks about this idea to give their work for program management and construction to Sandag staff instead of the International Water and Board. Um, I, I forgot the name of that acronym again. In order to do this, you probably need a new state law, federal EPA approval for a joint venture and an international agreement with Mexico. Your new alternative project delivery method worked great for Route 11 and Otay Mesa East point of entry with leadership, the same model for an alternative project. Can you conclude, can you conclude please? Uh, we are limited to three minutes. Yes, um, work for the EPA and local residents who wants um, immediate results. So um, what I'm just asking is that everybody analyze this idea so we could get some um, projects moving in the money spent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, please send your written comments to Hector and hopefully he can circulate them to COBRO members. Uh, do we have any other public comments or members of COBRO? I don't see any other hand. Okay, well, let's move on to approval of the meeting minutes. Um, we need to approve the uh, minutes from the April 5, 2022 meeting. So I'd like to uh, have discussion, comments, and someone to uh, make a motion that we uh, accept the minutes if appropriate. But I think we need the motion for the discussion. So Jason Wells, I'll uh, move to approve. Okay. Uh, Laura Raupo, I second. Uh, Laura, can you see that, that to uh, uh, your colleague, uh, Nando? I believe you are in transition, just to be sure. That's correct, Hector. Adelante. Hernando Duran, aquí de Tijuana. Okay, do we have any uh, discussion before um, we vote? Okay, well, please signify if you approve by saying aye. 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 <laughs> and uh, any... Uh, any opposed? 
And any abs abstentions? No, uh, we're passed, so thank you very much. Uh, we have two items uh, today in the consent uh, menu. One was the, or agenda, one was the approval of minutes, and the other uh, will be the memorandum of understanding between the cities of Tijuana and San Diego. Um, Hector will uh, offer his oral report uh, later on on today's agenda, but right now I'd like to move to uh, hearing about the uh, memorandum of understanding between uh, Tijuana and San Diego. And I think R Rita Fernandez is going to make that presentation. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Good to go. Good to go. Thank you very much, Hector and Paul. And uh, thank you very much to everyone for the opportunity to speak to you all today about the MOU that we signed with the city of Tijuana. Uh, so on May 11th, uh, Mayor Gloria and Mayor Montserrat Caballero of Tijuana uh, both signed the uh, renewed memorandum of understanding between both cities. Um, for those of you that are familiar, I'm sure, um, for many years now, we've had uh, a working MOU uh, between the cities. We are, of course, neighbors uh, and friends. We also are sister cities uh, since, nine, uh, since 93 um, and have had a working MOU that's been renewed by previous mayoral administrations. Um, and so we were able to uh, just last month renew that the MOU, which is a working uh, document uh, between both cities. Um, really, the goal is to promote shared, a shared vision for an economically vibrant mega region. Um, the goals are to create joint work plans between both municipalities, as well as working groups to address a number of issues that are important to both cities. Um, and this year, um, what we decided to do was in addition to sort of our, our standard language for, um, for these MOUs, we wanted to make sure and make it more robust to also include a component on advocacy to the federal and state governments. Um, so some of the sort of overarching objectives of the MOU include advancing efficient border crossings, uh, protecting uh, migrant rights, and um, also the federal and state advocacy piece, including having both cities advocate to their respective state and federal governments um, on border issues, including border crossings, um, the high wait times, uh, port of entry infrastructure, as well as addressing the pollution at the Tijuana River Valley. Um, some of the sort of more specific areas of collaboration between the two cities will include environmental protection, uh, municipal and regional planning, economic development, police and fire services, parks and recreation, uh, waste disposal and recycling, as well as emergency management and immigrant affairs. And so one of the uh, sort of end results of this, uh, this MOU will be that um, at the staff level, on both, uh, both cities will sort of put together work plans uh, with counterparts uh, from both cities. Uh, so looking at the directors of both the, um, the global affairs or binational affairs offices from both the city of San Diego and, and Tijuana, as well as the economic development departments, police, fire, planning, environmental services, transportation, stormwater, uh, sustainability and mobility and arts and cultures, arts and culture to name a few. Um, so really the, the overall goal of this MOU is to really renew our, our friendship um, and our joint goals um, to be able to put together an agenda um, as the truly binational region that we are um, and continue to work together uh, to really advance that vision for our residents. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up and uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, thanks. Uh, do we have any uh, questions for Rita about the, uh, the MOU? I see one hand raised from Team Bilas. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. I can't turn on my video. I apologize. I don't know. Uh, uh, forgive me. 
Um, I just had a quick question uh, related to these memorandum of understanding and to the border crossings in the uh, southern part of the state. Um, I, this is new to me. It's the first time in this committee. And so I hope this is an appropriate place to bring this up. But um, I'm wondering if the plans for the electronic structures that are going to be set up to try to improve the traffic flow and uh, uh, personnel flow uh, will include uh, bilingual or multilingual electronic infrastructure. It seems to me that language is a big block to commerce and understanding at the border. And uh, the thought to make the crossings more of international, because many people coming across are not just from Mexico, uh, than a binational. I understand this is a memorandum of understanding between Mexico and our city here. Uh, just wanted to bring that up as a, uh, a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions, uh, Rita. Um, uh, first of all, um, uh, I see the, uh, the MOU indicates that you'll be working on work plans or work plans. Will these be available at some point? Uh, and perhaps uh, uh, Cobra would be interested in hearing about the details of the work plans in the different areas. And a follow-up question to that would be, uh, do you do a year-end report on activities under the MOU or have previous administrations done that so that we can kind of track progress? So in regards to the second question, I'm not sure if previous administrations have done the same. I know that there's uh, been presentations at the city council committee on intergovernmental affairs uh, on more of the sort of the binational cooperation that included uh, counterparts, uh, representatives of both cities. Um, but it wasn't necessarily, I think, an annual report. Um, so I would have to sort of do a little bit of digging there to see what previous administrations have done in the past. Um, in terms of the work plans, I think as the, the work plans develop, and, um, you know, it'll be certainly myself um, and uh, representing the city, but also the city of Tijuana working together, I think as those come together, um, there will be opportunities to update uh, stakeholders and groups. There also is a, a component in the MOU that calls for work plans with other external stakeholders as well. So in addition to the city having its own, both cities having uh, sort of their work plans um, and communication, uh, the idea is to also engage external stakeholders um, during the implementation of the MOU so that there is a, no feedback and that we have other stakeholders um, engaged in the process. So I think more to come um, as all of that comes together. Um, so happy to, to keep this group updated as all of those uh, those plans come to fruition. Thank you Mr. very much. Mr. Chairman, Are you, there you, other questions? Yes, you have three raised uh, hands, Laura Araujo, and then we'll be followed by David Perez Tejada and then Jason Wells. Laura, or we can move to, to David Perez Tejada. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah you can, we can hear you. I'm sorry about this. I'm driving to our, our very nice border right now. Uh, first of all, Rita, uh, muchas felicidades. Congratulations on, on this fantastic step for our cities. And my question is, is the MOU document itself available to the public? Yes, and I believe it was included as an attachment in the meeting agenda. I saw, Hector, you had included that. Uh, so uh, yes, certainly it's, it's available to the public. Fantastic, thank you so much. Thank you. David. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, Rita, igualmente unirme al, al resto de las felicitaciones. Eh, creo que este tipo de, de ejercicios ayudan y abonan en mucho a, a nuestra relación binacional de la, de la región Calibaja. Eh, felicitar al equipo del, del alcalde Todd Gloria y, y obviamente al equipo de la, de la alcaldesa Caballero. Eh, como Estado nos sumamos a, a este tipo de, de esfuerzos que, que vienen a consolidar nuestra 
relación y pues la, la comunicación ha sido muy estrecha con, contigo y con todo el equipo eh, este, del ámbito internacional del alcalde Gloria. Y este, respondiendo a lo que preguntaba el doctor Gangster, eh, de acuerdo al procedimiento del lado mexicano, estamos obligados cuando se entera a la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores que se va a firmar un acuerdo de hermanamiento, estamos obligados a, a poder dar un reporte tanto de los objetivos, el seguimiento y la permanencia de, de este acuerdo, ¿no? Entonces, de, del lado mexicano sí debe de haber, eh, si es que lo hicieron las anteriores administraciones, un resumen de ello. Este, lo puedo ver con Ernesto Chávez y lo podemos pedir directamente a la Dirección General de Coordinación Política de la Cancillería. Ah, muchas gracias. Gracias, Daniel. De nada. Jason. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thanks, Rita, for your, your presentation. Um, and, you know, to help answer, I, I had the honor and privilege of, of writing the first MOU with uh, Denise, uh, Denise Garcia from then Mayor Sanders' office and, and uh, Lorena este, Flores from then uh, Mayor Ramos' office. So I can tell you there hasn't been reporting uh, from any administration since then. So I love that idea. Um, so uh, just, uh, two questions are your comment and question. The, the question would be, um, I love that we're putting words behind this. Now, as far as action, uh, where are you guys at in replacing your binational director? And I would hope maybe the mayor gave you some more money for some more personnel to do all of this wonderful work. And then uh, the, the, the comment would be just a, you know, we had a stakeholder. I love your idea too, that you guys put in this, this stakeholder group, uh, which again, was, that was in the original too. At that time, there was a group ran by Impan um, that was, we met once a month in the uh, Palacio Municipal and it was, you know, the Sandags and Chambers and the mayor's offices and Caltrans's of the world and their, the counterparts in Tijuana. And to me, that was one of the best working groups we've had in the last 20 years, as far as actually getting things done. You know, things like, you know, signage needed for pedestrian crossings or, uh, I don't know, coordinating, cordoning off uh, lanes if need be, or getting the police uh, in Tijuana to assist in some of the things. So, so I just speak from experience, that group was one of the most productive groups I've seen in 20 years. Um, so we haven't been able to get uh, Tijuana to reinstate that, but maybe that's something that could be done through this MOU. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Jason. That's really good feedback. Um, I think as we sort of think about next steps, uh, that's definitely a good idea to incorporate uh, for the sort of the external, the uh, the stakeholder engagement. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I'll add that to our list as we uh, sort of put together our, our next steps with Tijuana for how that's going to look like. Great. Uh, are there other questions? I don't see any hand raise, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you very much, Rita. We appreciate your presentation and your good work. Thank you very uh, much. Next, uh, we'll turn to Hector Vanegas, who will provide his legislative report. Hector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to try to be brief, uh, but uh, basically, last month on May 17th, the new general law of mobility and road safety of Mexico was published in the Diario Oficial, making it this uh, now uh, a full law in effect. This marks a change in paradigm, paradigm in Mexico, establishing a new framework and guideline to reduce road deaths, centering on humans over vehicles. The piece of legislation was originated in 2016 as a citizen's initiative and was developed through a process which included the passage of a reform to the political constitution of Mexico in 2020, guaranteeing mobility in accessible in, and safe condition as a basic human right. The new law uh, lays the foundation of the new mobility and road safety policy through a new national system of mobility and road safety that will prioritize access to mobility in the conditions guaranteed by the Constitution, particularly for those groups in vulnerable uh, uh, situations. Now, uh, states and municipalities have 180 days to harmonize rules and regulations accordingly, 
and this should happen then by November of this year. Uh, also, I want to mention now at a state level that yesterday the governor of Baja California, Marina Avila, released the state development plan, which is the document that serves as a guideline and framework for the six year state administration. This document, also known by its acronym PED, is based on seven axles or public policies and three transactionals the well being of all, health and quality of life public safety and justice, culture, sports and recreational time, education, science and technology, regional and urban development, economic and sustainable development, as well as human rights and equity and inclusion, transparency and combat to corruption and honest public uh, service and service to the people. And as uh, Rita just presented, uh, cities of San Diego and Tijuana signed this MOU also on May 11, that was already described. Also, I want to mention that uh, uh, last month, also the Cross Border Express CV CVX joined the Tijuana International Airport to celebrate the opening of the new processing facility with the new building and other features, such as an additional parking, expanded areas of inspections, including for CVP at Ota Mesa. The Grupo Aeroportuario Pacifico is adding capacity for an additional 10 million passengers. In 2021, Tijuana International Airport served about 9.5 million passengers. And it is estimated that by 2030, uh, we'll, reach by, we'll reach the 17 million passengers. Uh, in this concept, uh, Sandex CEO Hassani Krata and Deputy CEO Colleen Clemenson met with uh, GAP shareholders to start exploring opportunities for collaboration. As you remember, the 2021 regional plan includes a future connection between the border, CBX, and downtown San Diego. Our CEO is very enthusiastic about this concept, and Sandex will start soon as a couple work for the feasibility study. And just to conclude, uh, two quick announcements. Uh, Sandag is uh, currently working in two other important projects that you've been uh, noticing. One is the, uh, the advanced plan for the San Isidro Mobility Hub. Hopefully, this will be a topic in the next meeting of, the, of this committee. And also, uh, 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 the construction of the border to Bayshore Byway is uh, starting to be a reality. Uh, Sandak just announced the uh, published the request uh, for proposal. So, so we are in, on track to have this open by year 2025. And with this, I conclude my report, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, does anyone have a question for Hector? I can see a hand from Catherine Rose. Let me see. Please go ahead. Can you unmute, Catherine? Oh, there I go. I'm sorry about that. I already started. <laughs> um, hi, this is Catherine Rhodes. Almost one year ago, on June 29, 2021, Congressman Warren Vargas proposed an amendment to the Rules Committee, Print 117-9 for Section 12022, Management of International Transporter Water Pollution. And um, this was created in order to fund projects to eliminate the border pollution along the Tijuana River and get the money started. It's because the APA doesn't actually do construction. Um, they're giving the construction work over to the, um, the IBWC instead. So, <clears throat> so far this amendment has not passed in almost a year, maybe, doing, maybe due to the money going to international instead of local U.S. control like Sandag. So the solution is my non-agenda public comment where I discussed the a new proposed federal alternative project delivery method and joint venture agreement between the EPA, Sandag, Mexico, and IBWC. And so the other part of the solution is to change Congressman Vargas amendments to add Sandag into the definition. And then on page two, lines eight and 20, just replace commission with Sandag. And I believe this may allow federal funds in local San Diego County control instead of the IBWC international control. This change would allow Republicans you know, in the United States to vote yes on this important amendment so we could start the flow of approved funds 
um, to the EPA into the area. So, because right now we're not getting those funds, I guess. And then I also just wanted to mention um, there is a law on airport revenue, which allows um, transportation between airports to be paid for by airport revenue. So it can go just from one airport to the other. So I was thinking maybe you guys could look into that. Um, you know, they do it in Los Angeles. And so um, I believe um, the uh, Sandag CEO would probably know more about that. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank very much. You. Um, other questions for Hector? You have one member of the panelist, uh, Gustavo de la Fuente. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Uh, Hector, thank you for your uh, executive director uh, or your report, I'm sorry. And I uh, wanted to ask you about the uh, the advanced plan for the San Isidro Mobility Hub. I know that's that's in process. Any idea uh, as to the time frame for that? When would that be operational, more or less? What is the thought? I don't think there is an answer to that, but I want to defer if Zach, uh, who is my colleague that is uh, a, a, the project manager for that, if he has uh, an answer. But I believe there is no answer yet because this is just the beginning right. for the advanced planning. But Zach, would you like to complement? Yeah, Gustavo, um, and I was cutting out, I have pretty shoddy Wi-Fi at the moment, but I think the question was along the lines of when would the, Future Mobility Hub be operational at San Isidro? Yeah. Yes, that. So um, yeah, in the documentation that we have in the 2021 regional plan, obviously that's like a high level blueprint for what we're planning to invest in in the future to get our mobility infrastructure up to par for the growth that we're expecting. Um, if you were to just look at that, you'd see you know, the Mobility Hub is something that's scheduled to undergo construction and be implemented by the year 2035, I believe, is the horizon year. Uh, but what we're getting started on right now is something that we're hoping is, you know, a good faith effort to make investments at San Ysidro that are frankly needed now that we need to, to invest in to improve mobility just for the demand that we're seeing on a day to day as it is. Um, that said, this is kind of like an initial effort that's going to set the groundwork and set the stage, if you will, for the future mobility hub and the real kind of like uh, nitty gritty planning that's going to happen for the mobility hub kind of like what's to come after these initial improvements, that's not something that we'd, we'd get started on until probably next year. And like Hector said, we're gonna come back to this group, obviously, uh, when we start to scope out what exactly that effort is gonna look like and the planning process and involve this group uh, in a kind of like a deeper level. But um, yeah, the Mobility Hub uh, doesn't have necessarily a date similar to Otay Mesa East in terms of opening day at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other comments or shall we move on, Hector? We don't have more hands raised. Okay, um, I'd like to move to um, item five on our agenda, the 2022 Bike to Work Day and Tijuana Ando and um, cross-border celebration. Uh, in our last meeting, we had a report on the two projects uh, on either, or the projects on both each side of the border, the uh, Ciclovia Binacional in Tijuana and the border to Bayshore Bikeway in San Diego. Both projects are moving forward, hopefully uh, moving uh, toward conclusion and completion. And today I'd like to invite Elizabeth Cheney um, from um, Alianza Por una movilidad activa and uh, uh, Tomas Perez Vargas of the of CDT to uh, present uh, about progress on those great efforts. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Paul, and I hope everybody can hear me well. And in regards to Tijuaneando and bike to work, I have to say that it was. My first time, it was my first experience and I believe it was a great success and maybe take the opportunity to thank uh, the local authorities in Tijuana that help us, uh, you know, with some, uh, some issues and making sure that it was, uh, you know, a very, a very safe uh, rodada in, in Tijuana. I'll, I'll let uh, Elizabeth talk about it. And in regards to the project, 
I can pretty much say that CDT is committed, okay? Uh, and it's going to keep working as hard as we can to make sure that, uh, that the project uh, Ciclovia Binacional uh, keeps moving forward. We're going through a process because there's been some changes on some of the officials and the directors that are responsible for the mobility secretary in Tijuana. But everything from what I know is that uh, the new people are very supportive. And as soon as, as they you know, get fully, fully in place, uh, we will continue with the, with the process. So uh, you have uh, the CDT full commitment for that. And with this, I'll pass over to Elizabeth so she can share more about Tijuaneando. Adelante, Elizabeth. Ah, muy bien, muy bien. Buenas tardes. Como estoy aquí con Daniel Gómez Patiño, um, que somos representantes de la Asociación Civil Alianza por la Movilidad Activa. Si quieren pasar a la siguiente diapositiva. Muy bien, um, como que como habíamos ido uh, comentando en reuniones pasadas, como esta, este año represent, representó el, el onceavo aniversario de Tijuaneando en Bici, un evento hermanado con el Bike to Work Day. Um, inicialmente, habíamos pensado de realizar una actividad de presentación de la ruta binacional, pero debido a algunos cambios, como lo mencionó este Tomás, um, tuvimos que redirigir y estuvimos muy, muy agradecidos a tener la participación de varias autoridades en, en la redirección del, del evento. Si quieres a la siguiente. So. Vamos a, a, a mostrar algunas, algunas imágenes de, de, la, de los tipos de actividades que se han realizado en el marco de Tijuaneando en los 10, 10 últimos años. Si quieren a la siguiente. Um, Cómo han sido que creo que en la, la parte superior a la izquierda es una imagen de, de la primer, del primer evento del 2011. Um, en muchas ocasiones hicimos un cruce fronterizo simbólico, um, como es el caso en el 2014 y el 2015. Um, en la, la parte eh, interior de esta diapositiva del lado izquierdo, vemos una presentación en el 2017 de, uh, por parte de Alison Moss, um, que fue la encargada del proyecto del Border to Bayshore Bikeway. Um, también hicimos este, aforos en el área del chaparral um, de, de personas usuarios que estaban cruzando en bici en los años 2018 y 2019. Y en el, el, como en el año pasado, en 2021, hicimos una, un, un webinar en donde tuvimos diferentes presentaciones, entre ellos uno por parte de Alejandra Leal, uh, tomando el tema de la Ley General de Movilidad y Seguridad Vial, como lo mencionó Héctor a principios de esta reunión. Siguiente diapositiva. So, en, en este año, um, la, la Alianza por la Movilidad Activa, trabajando con, con CDT, uh, nos coordinamos con dos regidurías, um, con la regidora presidenta de la Comisión del Medio Ambiente, Salud y Desarrollo Sustentable, Um, Marisol Hernández Sotelo y también la, pres la regidora presidenta de la Comisión de Vialidad y Movilidad Urbana, uh, Georgina, Georgina Arana. Um, la, la idea era plantear o invitar a funcionarios que podrían llegar a su trabajo en, en bicicleta el día 19 de, de mayo. Um, también como una actividad uh, relacionada, hicimos una rodada um, corto de 2.3 kilómetros um, de las instalaciones de la Secretaría de Movilidad um, en la zona del río hacia Palacio Municipal el día del evento. Um, si quieres pasar a la siguiente, hay algunas imágenes de la dinámica. Aquí es, es la ruta cortito plano um, a la siguiente. So aquí, aquí son algunas imágenes de la dinámica de la rodada. Um, en la imagen al, al lado izquierdo podemos observar algunos usuarios de bici en la estación del SIT de, que está cercana de, del Hotel Pueblo Amigo en el Paseo del Centenario. Um, después pasando a la glorieta hacia Palacio Municipal. Siguiente. Y los árboles combinados con las camisetas. Ah, sí. 
Y aquí estamos en la explanada de, de Palacio Municipal. Como ven, hubo presencia de, de la plan Tijuana, um, las dos regidoras en el centro de la imagen y um, diferentes usuarios de bici que, que sumaron de, de... Sí, también hubo al, algunas autoridades de, de San Diego, como que creo que... Um, Por allá. Sí, sí, sí. Um, si quieren a la siguiente que aquí tenemos una imagen de la regidora Marisol que está con un, una activista de Tijuana que se llama Ivonne H. Tiene un proyecto de fanzine que, que compartía con, con la regidora. A la siguiente es el módulo que hicimos con apoyo de la regidora Gina Arana y su equipo. Um, ella aportó las naranjas y los plátanos para ofrecer o compartir con los usuarios que participaron en el evento. Y la siguiente. También con apoyo del CDT uh, hicimos un, un tríptico uh, que inicialmente habíamos imaginado como a, a incluir información de, de la ruta de, de la, la ciclovía binacional, pero en este caso por los cambios se, se nos hizo mejor incluir información útil uh, para usuarios de bici o como que estos datos de de la revisión sencilla antes de rodar y algunas como consejos para compartir de manera pacífica la, la calle o la vialidad con otros usuarios. Um, agradecemos mucho la diseñadora, reconocemos el, el trabajo de la diseñadora del, del CDT, a Valeria, um, que tuvimos un, una idea que la información estuvo, pero esta presentación se nos hace más, um, más divertida. Um, si quieren al, a la siguiente, estamos preparando para, para otra, otra actividad este próximo día sábado. También está en coordinación con la oficina de la regidora Marisol um, para ir explorando diferentes rutas que vinculan a puntos de interés como, como son parques. En este caso, existe infraestructura sobre los lomos de la canalización de primer, la primera etapa del río Tijuana, Um, que hay algunos puntos donde um, hemos identificado ciertas debilidades y ciertos como potencialidades que, que hay que um, tomar y queremos esto con las autoridades municipales. A ruido de prensa alrededor de las 10. No sé si Tomás uh, tiene algunos comentarios para cerrar. No, yo creo que yo creo que con eso este, redondeamos. Este, como dije al principio, fue todo una experiencia. Me tocó uh, do, hacer el bike to work desde, desde Chula Vista y, y se observó que ese día observé que sí había más usuarios en el trole yendo a, a este, a la, al cruce fronterizo. Yo creo que es todo. Uh, te regreso el micrófono, Héctor. Sí, de hecho me gustaría invitar también parte de esta actividad. I'm speaking now in Spanish. No? So uh, another person that contributed to this uh, cross-border activity was Jason Wells from the uh, San Isidro Chamber of Commerce. If you want to join, Jason. Oh yeah, thanks, Hector. Yeah, uh, yes, we did have our, as always, our, our sister spot, our stop uh, in San Isidro. Um, I do. I want to thank. Uh, Elizabeth and Daniel and the uh, Alianza for the, all of their years of, of tireless uh, advocacy for for uh, bicycle users and and greater use of bicycles, greater vias for uh, for bicycles. And you know, looking at it kind of in a, in a standpoint time right now, we're at a great opportunity with all the work the Alianza has done and the commitments that the city of Tijuana has made um, re in recent times to their bicycle routes and the coming, soon coming uh, construction of the Bayshore Bikeway Link, uh, we have that opportunity to go back and push the federal government for a bicycle crossing um, at the port of entry. Um, I can tell you during the 15 years of planning uh, for this port of entry, I consistently asked um, about uh, the, the bicycle crossing. And even though we knew it wasn't going to be open at the beginning, um, I ensured that I kept asking and kept getting an affirmative response from CSA that the port of entry is built to be able to have a bicycle crossing lane. 
whether or not that happens is an operational decision by CBP. So I believe with the, you know, each of the municipalities and hopefully states at some point doing their jobs at putting these routes up to the border, um, we, we really are making the point to push for, for the crossing and uh, maybe get a few of these cars uh, off, of, a few more cars off the, the road, a few more bikes crossing the border and a few more shoppers in San Pedro. Thank you. Well, thank you. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments from Cobro or anyone else? There is one hand from the public, Andre Villaseñor. Please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you great. Can hear you. great. So thanks for that presentation. That was a really informative presentation because I've been wondering like, what's going on with bicycles in Tijuana. I know that the city of San Diego has, especially like in the last probably five years or even less, they've really started to build out a lot of bike lanes, including protected bike lanes. And have made a lot of improvements in their bicycle and active transportation infrastructure. What's what kind of kind of just what's the overall status of bicycle infrastructure in Tijuana, and what plans are there in the future to continue in more bicycle infrastructure, like bike lanes and protected bike lanes, that kind of thing? I will not pretend to respond if I may, Chair Gunster. But uh, during the April meeting of the committee, uh, we had a presentation from CEMOF, the Secretary of Mobility of Tijuana, uh, that they uh, explained some of their plans uh, south of the border. If you want to revisit, that should be posted in our website. But I don't know if someone else wants to add something. Good. Well, I think we'll move on to our next presentation. And, and thanks again very much to Elizabeth and, and Tomas for their presentation. Uh, and congratulations for uh, continuing to work on, on this issue, because I think the goal is to have the region functioning uh, like parts of Northern Europe or Japan, where uh, bicycles to work is a very viable option for lots of people. And I think little by little, we're making progress thanks to your hard work. So again, uh, let's move on to our uh, next presentation by our own Zach Hernandez, uh, who we'll talk about uh, border crossing and trade statistics. Uh, uh, his last report to us was in 2021. Uh, relying mainly on 2019 data uh, and statistical data is always challenging in the border, but with the uh, pandemic, we've had lots of fluctuation of different numbers uh, and uh, hopefully Zach will uh, enlighten us on some of the sources and, uh, and help us uh, have a firm base uh, of data to to, for analysis and drawing conclusions. So Zach, please take it away. Thank you, Chair Ganster. Um, so I'm, for some reason, having trouble with my Wi-Fi, but I, hopefully everybody could see the screen, at least if my video cuts out, I may just turn that off in the middle of the presentation, but just a quick thumbs up if you could see the screen at least. Okay, excellent. So yeah, thanks again, uh, Chair Ganster, and thank you members of COBRO and all those in attendance. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Zach Hernandez. I'm a regional planner here at Sandag. Um, I've been around for you know the last seven or so years and focused on our border planning team for the last five or so ish years. So I'm familiar with the with the group, but if you haven't met me, that's a little bit about uh, myself. But yeah, as Chair Ganster kind of pointed out, um, every year Sandag puts together an annual report that kind of summarizes the the year in review, if you will of trends that we see at the border. So that includes crossing volumes of people, of vehicles, trucks, and the dollar value of trade that occurs between the California Baja California border. So once a year, we usually we put out that report and present it to the COBRO group, sometimes to the borders committee, post it online, use it as a resource. Um, today, what we're gonna present, and in light of us uh, having only shown this group um, annual data through 2019 as our most recent report, we want to show a little bit about, you know, obviously what happened through COVID, 
um, pre-COVID, during COVID, and in the recovery from COVID, take a look at some of those trends that occurred. Um, so this is just a quick, quick review or overview, if you will, of some of the trends that we saw, uh, especially in light of COVID and the related travel restrictions. But we also want to showcase a new tool that we put together and we think is going to be relevant for the COBRO group um, that helps provide easier access to this info as opposed to kind of waiting once per year uh, for that PDF report from SANDAG. Uh, but just to start out, I just want to emphasize that SANDAG and our partner agencies in the border region, we understand that all the ways that the border kind of enriches our daily life here, um, that's all made possible by the partnerships and the relationships with our neighbors in the California, Baja California, or Baja Calibaja mega region. And we know this dynamic is what sets us apart from the rest of the world and what makes us globally competitive. Um, and it's through this mega regional lens that the strategies, for instance, in the 2021 regional plan that Sandag put out, we seek to elevate the border and improve cross-border mobility. And we know doing so is super critical because given the measurable and significant migration of people and goods, that fuel the economy every day, we see the, the impacts of that on, on many different levels. Um, and we know in 2019, for instance, the mega region's land POEs between California and Baja California together processed a daily average of more than 200,000 people, over 85,000 personal vehicles. Uh, and that's just in the northbound direction. And in that same year, there was over 4,000 northbound commercial trucks and roughly $180 million in bilateral trade moving through the ports every single day which in 2019 represented a new record high. Um, and as, as we also know, on March 21st, 2020, travel restrictions that were imposed by the federal government in response to COVID-19 went into effect and limited access into the US to only essential travel, trade, and US citizens and residents that are returning home. Hector, I see you. Pausing. Unfortunately, the slides are not moving, so you are still on slide number three. Oh yeah, that's that's where that's where I plan to be. I think we're okay. Slide okay. Three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll almost concluded with this slide, but I'll advance in a moment. Um, but just as a little context, just kind of describing, you know, we know that the travel restrictions went into place March twenty first, twenty twenty. Um, and they're imposed by the federal government to, in, in a way, quell the, the spread of the, the pandemic. Um, and we know the most significant declines that we saw in the data were seen in April 2020. And that showed that the pandemic and the restrictions caused significant decreases in every category of border crossing activity. And so in the next couple of slides, um, we'll show some of that data in a, in a bit more detail to just get a, a really high level look at what the trends were and what the changes were. So for the first, I uh, just wanted to show the monthly level data for northbound individuals. So th these are people crossing either as pedestrians or as occupants and personal vehicles combined. So this is just like the full throughput of people who are crossing. And you can see over the last couple of years, it typically hovered around 6 million, 7 million, somewhere in between that range. And then after the travel restrictions were imposed and the pandemic was at its peak, uh, April 2020 is when we saw it drop to the lowest level uh, over the last couple of years, down to just 2 million in that month of April 2020. Um, so if you compare April 2020 to April 2019, which 2019 was um, kind of a, a pretty strong year in terms of total throughput, but if you compare that year over year, that's a 67% decrease in the crossings of people compared to 2019 in that month of April 2020. So just to paint a picture there. If we look at um, the same kind of data, the same trend line, but for personal vehicles, it's similar, but not as deep of a decrease um, as, as opposed to looking at the, the people who are crossing. If you just look at the personal vehicles uh, if, and you compare April 2020 to April 2019, that's a 51% decrease. Um, so a little bit less of an impact felt for the personal vehicle crossers, but still quite a significant impact. If we look at trucks, this is always kind of a unique case, especially for our region, given that it's a major gateway for facilitating international trade um, and the cross-border um, economy and industry clusters, clusters that need to move goods back and forth across the border. When we look at the data for, tr for trucks, uh, you might even kind of surmise that there almost was, was never a pandemic. There was a dip in the, in the initial part of the, the travel restrictions being imposed 
Um, but it was pretty shortly lived in terms of that decrease and it re rebounded pretty quickly just a couple months afterwards and even surpassed the volumes that we were seeing before uh, the travel restrictions and COVID. Um, so all in all, if you looked at April 2020 compared to April 2019, that's just a 25% decrease. But like I said, as you can see on the graph, it rebounded extremely quickly. And then if we look at the dollar value of trade, uh, similar story to the, the number of trucks that we saw in that last graph. Um, but leading up to COVID and the travel restrictions, we saw it hovering around 5 million or so per month. Um, and this is obviously combined California, Baja California, so Otay, Tecate, and Calexico East. And this is movement uh, via truck, so commercial goods moving, moving those modes. Um, but again, if you compare April 2020 to April 2019, that's a 44% decrease in the total, total volume, um, dollar value of trade moving through the region's POEs. Um, but like I said, similar to the volume of trucks, the value of the goods carried by those trucks rebounded really, really quickly. Um, and then the next slide will kind of get a quick overview of like the overall U.S. Uh, international trade picture too. So this is just a quick slide um, looking at similar data, monthly data of kind of like the top five trade partners that are typical for the whole U.S. US trade and national, international trade picture. So we typically have Mexico, China, and Canada jockeying for first place and, and carrying the brunt of the um, international trade. This is both imports and exports combined. And then Japan and Germany are typically in fourth and fifth place, um, doing a smaller smaller volume uh, in terms of trade, but still pretty significant. But what I just wanted to point out here um, is that even before COVID, we saw some fluxes, uh, especially if you look at China, which I believe is in green. I'm pretty colorblind, but I'm pretty sure that's green. Um, but even leading up to COVID-19 and the travel restrictions of 2020, we saw some definite fluctuations. And I'm sure this group can recall the, the trade tariffs that were um, floated and implemented to some degree through the Trump administration had some effect for sure. Um, but just wanted to point out that before the, the travel restriction of COVID, there was some fluctuation. Mexico and Canada you know, are strong NAFTA partners. That level of trade seemed to carry on pretty steadily. And then something interesting when the travel restrictions went into place, you see a pretty drastic drop for Mexico and Canada. And then we started uh, to trade even more with China in the first couple months of the pandemic, which is something I wanna point out to the group, not something I have a ton of insight on. I'm not, a, I'm not an economist or a trade expert by any means, but I just wanna point that out um, since we have the data here and just to kind of keep that, keep that in your mind as we kind of are involved in these conversations around the importance of, of near shoring our economic kind of, uh, mechanisms and infrastructure, um, reducing our reliance on, on, uh, these long drawn out kind of supply chains and near shoring and making better use of our geographic, uh, advantages in North America. Uh, but just to point that out on a kind of broader U.S. US trade level. So I'll try to keep it brief um, on this part, but yeah, the last few slides are just kind of a similar taste of what we present on a on a year to year basis in the annual report I described. Um, what we wanted to pivot to now that we're, you know, in the year 2020 and we have much better access and options for how we obtain data, how we share data, and definitely for Sandag as a region, as a regional agency that's hoping to become a bit more state of the art um, and a lot uh, better at how we disseminate information and how we make that, how we contextualize that information and share it um, as resources for our stakeholders and for the general public. Just wanted to share that we've actually completed work on a, a data tool, I'd like to describe it as, um, that kind of captures this annual report, but creates a interactive and automatically updated data tool where groups exactly like COBRO, stakeholders in the border region, all those who are interested in this data can go to interact with the data, get it for themselves instead of having to wait, like I said, uh, once per year when Sandet completes a, this PDF report. This is something that lives um that's that's more uh relevant uh refreshed regularly more up to date uh and hopefully more user friendly than a pdf report um 
but I'm actually going to switch screens and just do a quick walkthrough of the tool itself. I won't take too long. Um, I know you'll have things to do, but just want to point out um, the tool itself. And before I move on, I just want to shout out quickly Ruben Casillas, who was in the data science team here at Sandag, as well as Ann uh, Kuehler, who were pretty instrumental in helping me work on the story map, but also the data tool that's embedded within it, which I'll describe in a second. Uh, but just want to give them a quick shout out and thank them for their help. And hopefully this share screen works. Okay, so now you should be seeing on your screen um, what's called the story map, an ArcGIS story map. And this is what I just described is the new tool that we just published. Um, and if you're curious, we're actually going to be publishing this, pushing th this out via the social media channels for Sandag tomorrow. Uh, so if you're interested in diving deeper into it or even sharing it, retweeting it, et cetera, look out for our, our Sandag Twitter and our Instagram tomorrow and, and you'll see this posted there. Um, but just to walk you through, this is uh, based in ArcGIS Story Map, and if you've ever, ever used that before for different purposes, for example, I, I think in um, development of our 2021 regional plan, we put together a couple of these just to tell the story of how we were developing the plan, um, showcase some of the data, have people interact with some of the data. Same kind of thing here, but this is specific to California, Baja California, border crossing and trade data. Um, so just walking through it just really briefly, a really quick overview. I tried to keep this pretty minimal in terms of uh, language and text and to get to the good stuff as quickly as possible. This just kind of describes what you're looking at. Um, the next section analysis and highlights this just describes kind of the general trends like I, we pointed out in the slides earlier. What happened, what was happening before COVID, what was happening during COVID, and what's been happening in the recovery from COVID or at least in the aftermath of the travel restrictions that were lifted. Um, in November, but this is just a little description, some highlight of that. Won't go into it in depth, um, but some good stuff here, some good language to, to put into our, our arguments for the border, et cetera. And then this third section here, explore the data. This is where you land on the actual data tool that's embedded in the story map that we're publishing tomorrow. Um, this is actually the interactive portion that I was describing where you can on your own, um, explore the data to a greater degree. Um, like I was just showing in the slides in PowerPoint, those were monthly level data. The reports that Sandag's done before um, this, the report today have been annualized. So just looking at the last you know, two decades worth of annual level data. This tool lets you look at the annual data, but also dive to that monthly level. So for stakeholders who are interested in a particular port of entry and what was happening, you know, in January, February of last year, you can click and filter by that type of information and get to a, get to exactly what it what is your question and what you're trying to glean from the data set. Um, but all this information comes directly from and is automatically refreshed from the USDOT website. So we avoid completely any of the errors that I could have introduced into the the reports. Um, this is just the raw data from the Department of Transportation just filtered into these graphs that we structured in Power BI. Um, and if you're curious about that whole process, feel free to reach out to me after, after the meeting or at some point, and I can, I'm happy to kind of walk you through how we came about developing this. But just to show you, um, like I mentioned here, you're looking at uh, northbound individual crossings. And we know there's three other kind of key categories of crossings that you might want to look at in addition to people. So you're, you could also look at personal vehicles, and you could click there where it says navigation, and it'll take you to the similar graph, similar options for filtering, but for, but for personal vehicles. Same thing for commercial trucks. All the relevant ports of entry will be shown there. Same thing for the trade value. So these are all interactive. You can click through them, you can filter, you can export, um, you can drill down to the monthly level data for each category. Filter however you like. Let's just look at the last couple of years, similar to those last graphs. Here you can slide over and see kind of the changes through COVID if you're filtering for that time period. Just to give you an example. 
Um, and if you feel like you've clicked too much and caused kind of a confusion for yourself, there's this kind of clear all selections button at the top left. Keep in mind, you can just click that and it goes back to where it started. Um, but just to also point out, there's data notes to the bottom right. Like I said, this is all coming from the Department of Transportation. This will also show you the last time that the data was refreshed. So it looks like this was last refreshed two days ago. This was set automatically uh, to run in the kind of in the background. Um, it'll also show you the latest month of the data that's available. So the USDOT has pushed out all the data through April 2020, 2022, excuse me. Um, so that'll be reflected here on all these. And then you can click here to go to the FAQ um, of the data source if you want to dive deeper into it. And if there's any info that I didn't include in the story map about what the data is, some of the limitations of the data, um, you can go to the source itself and dive a little bit deeper if you'd like. Um, but that's just a little bit about this story map tool, the data tool that's embedded within it. Like I said, this is meant as a resource, something that can live on beyond these PDF annual reports that we do every year. This is something that I'm hoping groups like COBRO and other border stakeholders will go to as a resource to get the latest and greatest data um, without having to wait for me to respond or um, having to dig it up in some kind of other fashion. Um, but yeah, that's in, in short, that's basically the tool itself, the story map, the tool. And then at the end of this story map, you have some links to really relevant planning documents and research that all have to do with the border, trade, um, mobility, et cetera, and some links to, to learn more about the infrastructure and mobility projects that the region, SANDAG and partner agencies are kind of undergoing to improve cross-border mobility. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of the tool, and I'll stop sharing here. And yeah. That concludes uh, the report, and I'll pass it back to you, Chair Genster. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations on really creative and hard work. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, do any members of uh, COBRO have any uh, questions for Zach? Hector, you're on mute. But it's, I think you're calling out Tim. Sorry. Tim Balash. Yeah, we have one from the public. Is Tim Balash? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, just a quick question. This is really nice. Congratulations on a job well done um, to everybody. I, I have a question how the data gets into your system. Is this uh, hand entered? Are there reports that automatically come over for each of the agencies or governments or wherever and it automatically gets towelite? How much physical human effort does it take to actually put them in there uh, for this system? Yeah, so the beauty of this tool, the data tool that I just kind of clicked through, the beauty of it is that the data itself never touches the hands of any sand, SANDAG staff or data analysts. It's coming directly from a, what's known as a data feed from the USDOT website. So they simply provide the data set via a live link. We use that link to embed in this Power BI tool that I just showed. And the Power BI tool, we structured it on the SANDAG side to show the data, the ports of entry, et cetera, the way we wanted it to. But the underlying data, the raw data comes directly from the USDOT. So we never actually have to touch it. We just have to set an interval for how the Power BI data tool refreshes. And it's kind of hands off from there, or at least that's, that's the idea. Is SANDAG going to branch out to voting results? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I can't speak that's to that. That's a joke. Though. That's a joke. Yeah, I apologize. One. Thank you for your answer. Do we have additional questions? Yes, you, you have David Perez Tejada from members of the committee. Uh, it's not a question, it's more uh, a comment and I want to congratulate the Santa team, uh, Zach Hernandez for, for this effort. I think it's a, a really strong and very um, useful uh, tool. Uh, it's gonna help in, in decision making and also on doing the lobbying that different uh, binational groups uh, have been doing for the past years in order to um, uh, convince CDP talk with the different authorities in, in all the different levels 
in order to uh, pursue uh, a better and efficient uh, border crossing experience. Thank you, David. Other questions, comments? I don't see any hands face. Zach, um, how how long has has your system been up and running, and do you feel that it's pretty foolproof now? Uh, the reason I ask is uh, I think it's worth letting people in other border regions know about it, but uh, uh, but only after it's it's really been put through uh, the trial phases and is functioning well. What's your sense on? on the system, it's, it's pretty robust and uh, working well. Yeah, I'm pretty confident in this tool. Like I said, I'm not you know, a data analyst by trade, but be, as a planner, you're kind of forced to deal with a lot of data and doing that, you're exposed to a lot of the different tools and resources for getting that data. So in my experience, I, I think, Kind of speaking from what I've seen, I think this Power BI tool is kind of perfect because we don't have to download a massive set of data, have people like myself potentially introduce errors. This is pretty clean as it is a data resource and a data tool. Uh, so we're pretty confident as long as the USDOT doesn't drastically change their data set, um, which we could respond to pretty quickly. Um, like I said, this refreshes on like a biweekly basis. So anytime there's new data if, if the USDOT happened to change something drastically and it kind of breaks the tool, I'd get a notification right away, right away, and I'd be able to, to fix it um, accordingly. Um, but I have pretty pretty high confidence in the tool and that it, it, it'll be, um, I think it's pretty uh, intuitive. It's gone through a couple rounds of internal review and kind of tinkering. So I think what we have is pretty, pretty um, useful. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's certainly a great tool that will, as you point out, save a lot of people a lot of time and uh, I think really help uh, putting together a coherent uh, picture about our region. So thanks again. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I think we'll close the meeting for today. And uh, our next COBRA meeting is scheduled for Tuesday. September 6th, 2022 at 3 p.m. So uh, I guess that means everyone should have a good summer and uh, we'll see you uh, in September. And thanks to all the presenters and participants today. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. Thank you. I think Jason Wells, uh, oh, yeah. guess I'll yeah, I, I was just going to let everybody know um, we asked for and received new leadership at our port of entry. Um, and so this Thursday uh, morning, the, the chamber is hosting a breakfast with the new director of the, of the port of entry in San Isidro, Maritza Marin. Um, so that you can you know, feel free to give me a call or go on our website uh, for that information. But it's this Thursday at 9 a.m. Thank you. Be there. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Zach, would you take care of uh, uh, finishing the transmission? Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Thank you. Gracias. Have a good one. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego. Gracias. Gracias. Bye.